Okay, there great. Go. There we go. Thank you. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for making time for um, for joining this uh, presentation today on successfully selling your home in the off season. Um, this is sponsored by the Riverwoods Group um, and the three communities located in Exeter, Manchester, and Durham. My name is Lisa Clark, and I'm sales manager here at the Riverwoods Exeter community, and I'm joined by uh, Gabe Gabrielson, whom I'll introduce a little bit more. Uh, but we're going to start with a few housekeeping items first. Um, if you'd like to uh, uh, move the slide forward, please, Gabe. Um, great. So um, we um, we welcome your questions. Um, you may type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, but we're going to have you on mute until we get to the end of the presentation. And at that time, we will entertain questions. Um, you can, um, you know, we will also welcome besides questions, your suggestions on how we can improve um, our presentations. And if you have any other topics, that you think would be uh, good topics to share with you all. Um, we certainly welcome that. Um, and you're looking here at one of our uh, Riverwoods Exeter residents, Jerry, uh, working in the wood shop at the uh, Riverwoods Exeter campus. A little bit about Riverwoods, if you'd like to advance the slide, please, Gabe. Uh, Riverwoods uh, now it has three communities in uh, New Hampshire, the original community in Exeter, uh, the second community that we opened in Manchester, New Hampshire, and then in 2019, we opened Riverwoods, Durham. And moving on to the next slide, we'll tell you a little bit about the type of services that we provide. Um, we are all what's known as CCRCs or continuing care retirement communities. Some of you who are joining today are very familiar with that because you may already be on a wait list for one of our communities, but some of you may be less familiar. So I'm just gonna give a little overview on what a continuing care retirement community offers. Um, we are actually uh, a, a long-term care insurance product. Um, and because of that, our contracts are regulated by the state of New Hampshire. Um, we report out on our financial performance uh, annually to the state. Um, and as a long-term care insurance product, you're actually prepaying for potential uh, care in assisted living, memory of support, or nursing care. Um, and because it is a prepaid medical expense, a portion of your entry fee when you come to live here, as well as your monthly service fees uh, may be tax deductible. Um, all three of our communities are where you would enter while you're living independently um, and uh, take a break from doing any household maintenance. Um, we take care of transportation when or if you need it. Um, we provide a full uh, slate of activities, educational programs, um, fitness options, and social activities. And really, it's a way for you to move into an environment where you can increase um, your circle of friends um, have more socializing happening if you care to be more social, um, but really to stay in control of your life um, and be free of, of taking care of a home while you're here at Riverwoods. If you'd like to advance the slide, please. Um, so today I want to introduce um, our presenter, Gabe Gabrielson, um, and Gabe um, is an expert on this topic of real estate. He is a broker with eXp Realty, um, and he's licensed in three states, um, having started his career in real estate um, in the Silicon Valley, which I think most people are aware that's a pretty volatile, uh, high stakes <laughs> place to be um, wheeling and dealing in real estate. Um, and Gabe, uh, prior to that, was um, actually came from an engineering background at a leading uh, consulting firm. Um, his agency, EXP Realty, is really one of the fastest growing agencies in the U.S. Um, and um, after spending time on the West Coast, uh, Gabe is actually ha has returned to New England, um, having been raised here. Um, and we thank him for his service as a U.S. veteran um, and also an electrical engineer, probably solving many problems along the way um, and a true New Englander at heart. 
So Gabe, I'm gonna turn it over to you at this point. All right, thank you, Lisa. Uh, welcome everybody. Um, today, what we're gonna talk about is selling your home in the off season. And let me uh, go ahead and advance our slide here. The outline that we're going to run through today is going to be a little bit of terminology because that's going to help you understand as you're looking at uh, MLS specific information and data, um, how to kind of interpret it. Then we'll go through what the market update is. I probably am going to come from come at this from a slightly different perspective than uh, a lot of my colleagues. And uh, there's a specific reason for that that we'll get into. Then we're gonna talk about the advantages of selling during the off season. And when is the off season? What do most people consider that to be? And then also we're gonna finish up with, um, you know, how are you gonna find a good agent? And, uh, you know, agents are ubiquitous. So how do you kind of sift through who's good um, and um, how should you go through that process? And then we'll come up with a little conclusion at the end. So the first thing I wanna talk about um, is inventory. What is it? It's uh, you know pretty simplistic. Most people probably have a good understanding of this. It is the quantity of active and pending homes on the market. This though is um, you need to be careful on how you're breaking this out because inventory of single family homes, condos, land, or multiplexes in residential real estate that's typically considered to be one to four units, um, those can look very different when you're looking at inventory. And again, keep in mind that those are for active and pending homes only. Days on market. Um, this one sometimes can be a little confusing, um, but it is the time that a home um, is put on the market and then goes into contract or under agreement pending. Um, where the confusion lies is when you look at historic days on market for that particular property. Sometimes what will happen is a home will be on the market could be for six, you know, 60 days, 90 days, um, you know, nine months. And then what happens is the seller might take it off the market for a period of time, put it back on the market at the same price or maybe slightly smaller, but then it looks like it's a brand new listing when in fact it has been on the market for a little while. So as you're looking through that, uh, keep that in mind and go back and look at the history of a particular uh, home. This is particularly important for those folks uh, that might be downsizing. So maybe you're going to make an interim step from, you know, a larger home that you currently have and own um, to something that is smaller. You're starting the downsizing process and then um, perhaps moving into Riverwoods at uh, some point in the future. Months of inventory is the number of homes for sale divided by the number of homes sold in one month. That's typically used for the preceding month. And again, this is one of those things you want to look at. Is it single family homes? Is it townhomes? Uh, a multiplex? Um, the big takeaway for the months of inventory that is probably important is it's an indicator of how, how the pace of the market what type of a market is and, and how fast of a, of a market. Anything that is zero to three months is typically considered a seller's market. Four to six months is considered to be a balanced market. And then if anything over you know, six plus months, seven plus months is really a buyer's market. If we look at the graph here, you'll see on the left-hand side, the months of inventory. And then on the right, you'll see the active properties. Um, those for several years now, we've been in a perpetual seller's market. What's going to be interesting to see in 2023 is what is that going to do? Are we really going to be going more into a balanced market or is it going to shift into a buyer's market? And we'll talk about that a little bit later. 
absorption rate. This is another one that um, can be presented to you in a couple different ways. And absorption rate, again, is another indicator of, you know, kind of the pace of the market and what type of a, a market it is. It also will give you a good indicator of how much, how fast the homes that are currently on the market, if no other market uh, homes come on the market, how long will it take to deplete the inventory? So one way that this information can be presented is as a percentage. If you, what I did is I took the previous slide here and I enlarged the bottom portion down here. And you can say, see in this case, absorption rate is presented as a percentage. And you can see here, seller's market is anything with an absorption rate over 20%. And in this case, the absorption rate is um, 2x to uh, 3.5x or so, um, that 20% threshold. So you can see again that we've been in a very strong uh, seller's market. The other way in which absorption rate can be presented is as um, the number of months. So this is kind of a close um, cousin to um, our months of inventory. The big takeaway here is down here where it's a seller's balance or a buyer's market. Anything less than five months is considered a seller's. Five to seven months is a balanced market over seven months. Um, is considered to be a buyer's market. And the way this works is you pick a time frame. And th this, when presented this way, this is important because you could pick a time frame anywhere from one month, three months, six months, and that could have a very dramatic impact um, on this number, depending upon whether you're in a shifting market or not. And uh, by all accounts, we are certainly in a transitioning market. So what you want to find out is the rate of home sold, which is the time frame you choose, which could be say three months. You divide it by the number of homes sold in those three months, and then you multiply it by the number of active homes currently on the market. And again, it's important to look at, are we talking about single family homes? Or are we talking about condominiums, multiplexes, as well as the area that you're looking at. For example, you could pick one whole county, you could pick a town within a county, you could pick a school district, and those absorption rates um, could converge or they might diverge um, depending upon how you're structuring um, your search criteria. I would also say at this point that anytime you're looking at data and statistics, you always want to be careful about how large is your data set, because typically you can draw better conclusions from a large data set than you can a small data set. And always look at your data um, with a critical eye. Does what you're seeing make sense from other sources of information that you might be pulling together? Before I uh, go on to um, our next market update. Are there any questions that people might have? I don't see any in the Q&A, but let me go ahead and pause and, and see if anybody wants to um, ask anything. Nope, okay. Hopefully that all makes sense. So let's now look at kind of a market update. This slide here, what I wanted to do with this slide is to put things in historical context when it, it comes to homes sold. And this goes back to the year 2000, all the way up to what's predicted to be 2023 by the National Association of Realtors. You can see that the average homes sold is, you know, right around maybe four and a half-ish million um, homes. 2021 in green, those are 
uh, pandemic years. And then the 2022 and 23 in red, we haven't finished out 2022 yet. So those are kind of where are we going to end up for the year? And the, what does next year look like uh, from a, a quantity of homes sold during the year? The other thing I want to look at is let's look at interest rates because one of the one of the big, um, thank you for that, um, getting closer to the mic. I didn't appreciate that. So, you know, when you decide to put your home on the market, obviously you have a pool of buyers and they right now are hypersensitive to interest rates. And, you know, maybe for good reason, but when you look historically, interest rates are hovering now right around 7%. And, that is not bad when you look at a historical factor. I mean, if you look back in 1982-ish, you know, rates were up in the, you know, 18%. I know when we first moved to California in 2000, our first mortgage was at nine and three quarter and our second mortgage was at 11 and a quarter. So anything when we got down to 7%, everybody was like doing a happy dance. And now we're kind of getting back to those normal levels. I think buyers are gonna come around. They're gonna understand that, okay, historically they're not bad. Um, so let's go ahead and make the move. When it comes to the buyers and the number of buyers, um, there's always the supply and demand. That's kind of um, uh, economics 101, right? If you have a um, low supply of inventory, which we've had perpetually now for a number of years, and the demand of buyer is very, very high, um, home values are gonna tend to appreciate. With this, I don't wanna go into a lot on this other than draw your attention to a couple things. First of all, this was um, something that was done in 2014. And so you can, at the bottom on the age, you can add eight years to those numbers. The interesting thing is um, the boomers are gonna be re you know, retiring. Uh, I'm last year of the boomers or the first year of Gen X, depending upon um, what graph you look at. My wife's Gen X, so I always tell her I'm a Gen X guy. Um, you know, the population for Gen X millennials are as high, almost as high as the baby boomers. You combine those two generations and you have a massive number of people and buyers looking to get homes. So keep that in mind as we're gonna be looking for the uh, predictions. And uh, Craig, I'll get to your um, question here in a minute. So what, what I did is I looked at, you know, I always look at articles from various sources. And this article that um, I looked at was, had Dennis Shershikov, who's an economics professor at the city, uh, city University of New York, Robert Johnson, a finance professor at Creighton University's Hyder College of Business, Rick Sharga, Executive VP at Marketing Intelligence for Atom Data Solutions. They provide a lot of data to various industries and real estate um, is certainly one of those. And then Nadia Evangelou, uh, she's the Senior Economist and Director of Real Estate Research for the National Association of Realtors. When, when we look at what interest rates are going to do, um, you know, the Fed often talks about interest rate hikes as it pertains to um, slowing down or, you know, either, either feeding the economy to try to stimulate it or to slow it down. They consider it a blunt instrument. And right now we've had a number of rate hikes. We just had another three quarter percent in, uh, increase in basis points. So with all things considered, we're still expecting the feds to raise rates again. Um, Dennis is expecting rates in 2023 to be upwards of eight and three quarter percent. 
Robert Johnson is anticipating eight and a half percent, and Rick Sharga is thinking they're going to be around eight percent. So depending upon, um, and this is another particular uh, a, a point as it pertains to your loan amount. If you have a substantial down payment um, and you're in a home in a five hundred thousand dollar price point, maybe you have fifty percent down. You know your loan amount is going to be quarter million. A half half a percent interest rate hike on a quarter million is not as dramatic as say in Silicon Valley, where you might have a jumbo loan that you're get, getting in the range of a two million dollar loan. In which case, I, you know, a half a percent, quarter percent even can be a significant um, payment difference. Nadia, on the other hand, kind of kind of laid out three different scenarios. And if interest rates, if the Fed continues to hike the rates and inflation increases, then Nadia is expecting rates to be around eight and a half percent. In scenario two, if the consumer price index responds to the Fed's efforts, then it's you know, she's thinking that maybe it's going to be seven to seven and a half, which is kind of where we're hovering now, uh, ar around the seven, not seven and a half percent. Um, and then scenario three is the Fed continues to raise hikes, uh, raise the rates, and we bump into a, a recession, in which case they're then going to want to try to stimulate the economy. So they might pull back on rates and we might get back into the five percent range. So you can see here that these four experts vary greatly um, from, you know, worst case scenario on scenario three with Nadia, 5%, up to, you know, Dennis's prediction of eight and three quarters. What are home sales going to do? Well, um, if we look at Rick Sharga, Rick thinks that our um, numbers are going to be right around the four and a half million range. So if we go back to that other chart, that is pretty much right there in um, in the vertical bars. In the, okay, sorry, I was looking at uh, another attendee's question. Um, that's right there in the average. So. Dennis and Robert, they both are kind of echoing what Rick said. And then again, you know, Nadia is consistent, uh, consistently going with the three different scenarios. In scenario one, they could expect a, uh, we could expect a drop of 10% in home sales. Scenario two, we could drop seven to eight, or in scenario three, where we've gone into a recession, sales could drop by more than 15%. Um, let me, okay, so on the anonymous attendee, um, which graph, if you could tell me what graph are you specifically um, asking about? I don't, I'm guessing it is not the home sales one. So my Craig, my prediction on selling mid 2023. Um, let me go ahead and do this, Craig. Let me pause that question until we get kind of towards the end, and then I'll jump in after I summarize what kind of the experts are saying, um, you know, on this particular article. Based on the market, how would you price your home? That's a great question, Sandy and Duncan. And I'll get to that as well. So um, again, here are the annual home sales. I want to I want to keep this top of mind when we're looking at you know what are what are the sales going to do? Even if we drop um, ten percent, and the average is four and a half million, that's four hundred and fifty thousand. We're still looking at a four million dollar. Um, number of homes sold in 2023, which still is pretty good. 
um, 10% drop in home sales is not bad, particularly when you look at the fact that the two demographics that we looked at earlier, the millennials, the Gen Xers, they are, you know, between them about 150 million uh, strong. So if home sales drop, that means the supply is probably not going to be there, but the demand is still consistently very, very high, which is a great thing for sellers. What are we looking at with home values? Um, so Robert Johnson feels that higher rates will affect values and soften the price. Um, Rick Sharga feels they'll soften five to 10%. And Nadia um, thinks, and I tend to believe this one, I tend to kind of fall in line with this one, which is because demand is still very, very high, I think home values are gonna remain flat. Um, again, it all depends on what the economy does. So if we, if we look at all, all this, um, I don't think we're gonna see an excess of inventory. I think it's still gonna be a very, very good market for sellers. I think the, um, all the leading indicators are gonna be such that uh, demand is gonna outpace supply. The other, the other part of this equation are new home starts. And those are builders that are building single family homes or they're building high density homes. Those oftentimes when we start seeing a slowdown in the, con the economy, they start pulling back on their new home starts. And that is in fact happening as well. That's oftentimes a leading indicator of um, what the uh, housing market is gonna do. So I, I tend to think that prices are gonna remain flat. I think the buyer demand being high is gonna um, keep it such. The other factor I think too is if you pick a home uh, in an area, say it's $500,000 and you have so many buyers looking for that particular property, if somebody has been moved down in price point because interest rates have bumped them out, their debt to rate income ratio has thrown them into a lower price point, you're still gonna have significant and um, sufficient uh, demand in buyers for that original price point of $500,000. I hope that makes sense. Um, Craig, if I didn't answer your question, uh, go ahead and uh, chime in again. Okay, uh, let me let me go back here real quick. I want to go back and see if I can pull up. Ah, okay. So let me let me go back to some of our our um, terminology charts. Mon ah, thank you. Terminology months of inventory. Okay, here we go. All right, so on the right-hand side, on the right-hand legend or uh, axis, you have the number of active listings. Those are the, that's the bar portion um, in blue. The green is the months of inventory um, going across. So you can see on the left axis, you have uh, zero to three, and then across the bottom, your x-axis, you have the, um, the month. This, this goes back to you need to look at what type of data set are you looking at with us having low inventory for a long period of time sometimes the numbers are a little bit skewed because you have one data point that throws it out of whack let's look at this here real quick this is the days on market you have closed sales, which is the section down below in blue, and you have active, um, the dotted green line. And if you look at September of 21, 
you have average days on market of 250 with, only, with less than 50 homes sold. So in a case like that, what you have to do is you have to go back and look at the actual original data set and say, okay, what is skewing this number? That's why as an electrical engineer, I always talk about looking at data sets with a critical eye. Because in a case like this, why is in September of 21, average days on market 250, and they're um, in September of this year, you know, they're around 60. And that's where looking at the actual data makes most sense. I hope that answered uh, your question. What are the main factors, uh, main drivers for buyers in a high mortgage rate situation? Um, of course, buyers, their, their driver, their motivation uh, is very specific to them. Sometimes it's we've, we've been looking in this market a hot seller's market for so long that we don't care what rates are doing. We want to get into a home. So we're just going to, you know, pay whatever price it is. And then knowing that rates are cyclical and real estate markets are cyclical, if rates go down, then we can always refinance. The other thing that we're seeing a resurgence of is adjustable rate mortgages. And those are particularly attractive um to buyers because for the first you know five seven years they have an adjustable rate and then um, you get a fully amortized rate after that the assumption is during that five seven three five seven time frame rates are going to drop to a point where you can refinance into a 30-year fixed and have a much stabler um monthly you know outlay a fixed cost. The other good thing about a buyer buying in a higher um, interest rate, well, they get more tax write-off. I mean, that's always a great selling point for them. Um, however, when rates do drop, for them, it's like having extra money in their uh, budget that they can do other things with. Um, Quentin, this probably is going to be um, important to everybody as well. Uh, uh, Quentin asks, how do I feel about Zillow estimates? Um, my answer to that is, it depends. There was an article, I think two years ago, the CEO of Zillow put his home on the market. I think if, if I remember the numbers correctly, it was like $1.7 million was the Zestimate. And that's the Zillow estimate. It then sold for less than $1.3 million. So in his own case, you know, that is a significant drop, you know, a $400,000 drop. What I always say, this came into play a lot back when we had the financial meltdown in the 2008, 2009 timeframe. Um, I was in Silicon Valley doing real estate there. And there was a huge condominium townhome development of like 600 units that was all built up between 2004 and 2007. So it was massive. All those were, you know, the cookie cutter units. So they were all pretty much the same, all built within a very short time frame, And it was also very, um, very recent in comparison to when the meltdown happened. So in cases like that, the Zillow estimate can be um, pretty accurate. Again, it goes down, it comes down to your, um, you know, what are they comparing it to? Zillow cannot look at a neighborhood that maybe what is a very well-established neighborhood, 30 years old, 50 years old, where homes have been uh, completely remodeled, some are original, and Zillow can't take that into account. In a case like that, um, you have to go in and look at the specific homes in those areas to do your estimate. So I always take Zillow um, with, you know, it's a data point, it's a data point, but you need to look at multiple data points. And that's how I go, at, go about 
looking at a recommendation to a seller on putting their home in the market. Let's look at data and information from multiple vantage points. See if there's a convergence of the data. If there is, that's good. That's a good indicator. If not, then we have to use our best, um, you know, try to let logic prevail and come up with a number. And a starting list price is just that. It's an offering price to the buyers. And the buyers in any market are going to be quick to respond to that. And we can talk about that a little bit later. Um, okay, Craig and Susan, this, uh, these are national data. What is happening locally in New Hampshire? Um, good question. And at the onset, that's where I said I I'm going to be presenting this a little bit differently than uh, some of my colleagues might, because you know we may have uh, people on this call from um, New Hampshire. They might be from Maine, Massachusetts. Maybe they're you know further out. I don't know where everybody is from. Maybe Lisa, you can chime in and let me know. Um, but that's a question that I I will happily answer um, you know when we're outside of this call and if you give you know provide me with information I can help with more locally in New Hampshire either by town or by uh, school district or we can even look at county um, let me see let me get back on track here real quick and see how are we doing on time Lisa so we have about 20 minutes remaining, Gabe. I might suggest okay. that we get through the rest of your slides and then address yep. questions at the end just yep. to keep it flowing. Yeah, thank you, though, for the questions so far. Um, they're great questions, and they're very appropriate. So now let's get into off-season selling and eight reasons to sell in the off-season. There are more, but I just chose um, eight of kind of the top ones. First, we'll, what we want to do is define what is the off season. And here in New England, um, a lot of people will define that generally from the time school starts to the pickup in the spring. That's a broad, you know, um, time differential there. You know, you're six months or so. So about half of the year could be considered off season. Mostly people look at off season as being particularly around the holidays and towards the end of February. So that time frame, you know, say November 1st through the end, end uh, excuse me, sorry, um, through the end of February is what I consider to be the off season. But particularly during the holidays, because what we see is a lot of sellers Rightly so, you know, they want to enjoy their family time. They want to enjoy vacation if they're taking it, you know, they're getting time off from work and they want to enjoy that time without the, you know, quote, hassle of having their home on the market and having listing appointments or potentially open houses, um, those sorts of things. However, the buyers that are still looking during that time frame are tend to be super serious because they they know that um, other buyers will be taking time off. So if they're out there, you know, pounding the pavement, if you will, um, they feel like they could be more competitive and maybe even they don't have to compete in a multiple offer situation. The serious buyers um, have more time. Typically during the holidays, everybody takes time off. So they're using that time to really be out there looking at everything they can on the market. And um, as a seller um, or as a, a seller transitioning to buy something else, another thing to be looking at are homes that are not on the MLS. And we can talk about that either offline if you want to communicate, uh, you know, get in touch with me. We can talk more about that. But there are ways to get homes that are not on the MLS as well. But the buyers that are serious during the holidays, they're looking to take time off and still continue their home search. Supply and demand is going to be in your favor. As sellers are taking their homes off the market, 
if you have yours on the market, there's going to be less supply and less competition for you. Uh, this particularly happens when you might have several homes in uh, a tight geographic area that are on the market at the same time. Because one thing we do know in this industry is when one home comes on the market, in 90, within 90 days, we typically are going to see several more come on the market as well. So if everybody else is, you know, I use the analogy jumping out of the pool and you're the only one in, well, that's going to be great for you. The other part of this is people like to tend to like to decorate their homes during the holidays. And with that, the houses show better. It also puts the buyers in a, a, a frame of mind where they go into a home, they smell the, the, you know, the festivities, the holiday sounds, the smells, and you know, selling residential real estate is an emotional business. Um, it's not like commercial where the, the data, the numbers really drive the transaction. So if you have a place that is super inviting, super shows super well, um, buyers tend to get a more, more emotionally attached to that. So we talked earlier a couple of minutes ago about you as the seller taking time off to spend family time or vacation. That's fantastic what we can still do during that time is you can schedule showings around that vacation or family time. In fact, if you're on vacation, it can be the best time to be showing your home or maybe having an open house with your agent um, because you're not there. You don't have to worry about, you know, keeping it in show condition. You're off enjoying a vacation and um, the agent is getting people into your property. So this one here, uh, I'm just gonna touch on it there. If you're at the end of the year, a lot of your tax benefits that you have tend to be property taxes as well as your mortgage interest that you get to deduct. If you're selling during the holidays, you've captured uh, most of that and you've already paid that out. So, um, you know, that is an advantage but talk with your accountant because there could be other tax advantages for you depending upon how your year has shaped up. Um, you might have a portfolio where you, know, you have certain gains or losses that you have to work with and offset. Um, maybe it makes sense to do some type of a you know, charitable, qualified charitable uh, contribution that will factor into this. So I would say talk with your uh, accountant. The other thing about selling during the holidays and any time of the year, if it's a seller's market, is you can negotiate a longer escrow period. So if you put your home on, say, November 1st, but you really don't want to be moving out until after the first of the year, you can extend out your um, escrow period. So say instead of taking 30 days to close, you decide you wanna be 45 days. And then you negotiate a rent back from the buyer for another 45 days. Lenders typically don't like to do it more than 60 days uh, because then to the buyer, they might consider that to be an investment property rather than their um, personal residence. All right. So I hope that those that makes sense. Uh, this time of year, I am always encouraging sellers, if they're thinking of waiting till the new year, um, to really, really consider selling during the off season. Uh, I have a client that we're probably going to be going on the market uh, just before Thanksgiving. And all, for all these same reasons I outlined to them, um, they've really embraced. So how do you go about finding an agent? First of all, ask for recommendations. You know, Facebook is a great place um, for you to, to go on and say, hey, I'm looking to sell my house. Somebody please uh, give me some recommendations. I would always start a little closer to home, if you will, from friends, families, colleagues. Maybe you had an agent that you uh, used last time that was fantastic. No reason not to use them again. But, you know, Getting a referral or a recommendation is much better than just doing a Google search for agents. 
um, because there are so many um, ways that people can get themselves in front of Google, you know, click for pay or, you know, Angie's list kind of things. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they're a competent agent. And that leads us to bullet point number two, which is ask for an interview references. So if you find an agent, say through Angie's list, that nobody you knew in this world had an agent. Um, I find that hard to believe because you, uh, you can't shake a stick without hitting 10 of us. Um, go through and do your due diligence. Interview their references and, and grill them. You know, obviously they're going to you know, give you references that are going to you know, make them shine, but ask some tough questions um, about them and really drill down. When you have the agent with you um, and you're now interviewing the agent themselves, you know, ask things like, you know, how do they market on and off MLS properties? Um, how do they do interior and exterior video? Do they do drone footage? Do they do voiceover on their video? Do they only do still pictures? Mm -hmm. Are they doing a virtual tour, um, which is nothing more than taking the still images and panning around them? Um, it's, it's called the uh, Ken Burns effect and um, very easy to do in software, but it doesn't really lend itself to what consumers are looking for. 87% or so uh, of buyers begin their search online and it is imperative, and I probably can't stress this enough, it is imperative that your, what you present online is top notch. Um, ask the agent, are they using a professional? Um, I hire a professional to do all my photographs, my video, my drones. Um, I have a wife who is in marketing and advertising, and I have her script out a voiceover. So I meet with my sellers and say, hey, what drew you to the property originally? And then I have her put that together with information from me into a dialogue, and then I have a professional do a dub over or a voiceover for that. Um, with the Gen Z um, and uh, millennials, or excuse me, Gen X and millennials, how do you how do you market to them? Um, and this is this is a question to ask, you know, the agent. How are you going to capture those buyers? Because they typically want to communicate by text on the, a tablet of some sort. They don't really want to do a lot of face-to-face -face, um, just for time's sake. You know, their norm is texting um, and using their mobile devices. Do they do anything like a, like a slide broadcast? That is marketing to neighbors of properties. Um, and you do that in order to find out, hey, so-and-so um, has a friend that they've been wanting to move close by and this is a perfect opportunity to capture them as a buyer. I had a home in California um, that I sold this year, and that's exactly what happened. The next door neighbor had their best friends um, that didn't know the home was on the market, called them, and they ended up buying the property. So, um, you know, really dr dig down into how are they going to market the property and capture everybody possible with the emphasis being you know, through the internet. Um, the other question you have to ask yourself is, do you want a full-time or a part-time agent? And uh, this business is a tough business. We have an 87% attrition rate, uh, 87, a little bit higher attrition rate for new agents within the first year. So although the number of years in the industry is not necessarily a direct correlation to competence, there are certain things that you can only get by being immersed in the industry for a period of time. And I would say that's true for any industry, not just real estate, any profession. So if somebody's just kind of dabbling and doing this on the side, there are important things about our industry that they might not be as sharp and keen about um, than somebody that's in the trenches day in, day out. 
the other thing I would say also is understand that you get what you pay for. And a lot of times in uh, these types of forums, I'll get questions about interest rates, oh, excuse me, uh, commission fees, and how much should I pay and those sorts of things. The first thing to understand about commission is they're negotiable. So with that, you know, talk with your agent, get an understanding of what you're expecting from them, because this is a partnership. And if you're in a transaction with a good agent, it is going to go seamless because they're gonna be able to anticipate problems because every transaction has problems. They'll be able to anticipate them and hit them off at the pass um, rather than it to kind of fester and become a bigger problem down the road in the transaction if say you're in, in escrow. So, you know, you get what you pay for. Um, if you go to a surgeon and, you know, you're shopping surgeons and one is gonna do something for, you know, 30% of what the other one is, is that somebody you really want operating on you? <laughs> um, you know, that might not be the best analogy, but it is, you know, not too far off. The last thing I would say is, as you go through your due diligence and really do your due diligence, trust your instincts. You know, you're gonna to have to make a decision. And with that, um, you know, just kind of go with your gut and keep a close, in close communication with your agent. Um, they should be, that your agent should be communicating on a regular basis, letting you know kind of where we are, what's going on, how many showings have we had, how much interest have we had, those sorts of things. Um, and if you, tr you've, you trust your due diligence and you trust the agent, trust their advice. Um, I would, Gabe, Gabe yes. we have we we just we only have five minutes left, so okay. I want to make so, sure you get through your conclusion and answer yes. these questions. Understand, uh, real estate is is um, cyclical. Uh, markets are cyclical, rates are cyclical. Uh, selling in the off season, I believe, is a great time. Again, here we go. Find a good agent, trust their expertise, analyze the market, the economic data, the current local and world events and make the best decision that's right for you. The market's going to do what it's going to do. And you have to decide if what the current market is, is a market that you wanna you know, kind of play in and do your move, whether it's trading up, trading down, doing a lateral move, a temporary move, um, those sorts of things. And um, you can always adjust. You know, if you decide you want to put your home on the market, but it's not working out, you can take it off the market and you can try it at a later date. So don't feel like you're locked into, oh, I've signed a listing agreement. Um, now I'm stuck. You know, th there are things you can do to um, hold off and try a better time. Um, if I can be of further help, you're going to get copies of this slide. Um, you know, reach out to me. I am happy to have a conversation, have coffee, talk, whatever. Um, go ahead and reach me at any of, um, you know, my website is gabegabrielson.com. The 603 number is a Google voice number. I also have a cell phone number that just forwards to my cell phone. And of course, you can always email me. Uh, let me see. Based on the market. So Sandy and Duncan, based on the market, how would you price your home? You can price, you can overprice a home in any market. That said, look at what the current market is doing in your area specifically and be, be in alignment with that and also be open to making adjustments because the market is very good at speaking to you. If you, fair market value is defined as what a buyer is willing to pay, a seller is willing to accept and it's an arm's length transaction. So let's pick a number of 500,000 as fair market value for your home. You price it at 200,000, you're gonna get a huge bidding war. But the buyers are sophisticated. They're looking at all these numbers too. Redfin has one of the best data analysis sites, um, I think. Buyers are looking for those things. So a lot of the buyers are very sophisticated. They're gonna know whether your home is in alignment with the market or not. When you pick a number um, to put your home on the market, 
if that $500,000, you're putting it on the market at 750, it's unlikely you're gonna get any offers. What's worse is you have now presented this property on the MLS, on the internet as a $750,000 home with a fair market value of 500, there are gonna be buyers that you're gonna miss and you won't even know it because they're just gonna keep watching it on the internet and not reach out to the agent because you're, there's too much of a disparity between what they think is fair market value and what you're listed at. Trying to get a buyer on a second look on a home is very, very different. The adage, you, you never get a, a, another opportunity, to, a second opportunity to make a first impression is very, very true when it comes to pricing homes. So find your agent, um, go through the numbers, be critical, ask good questions and trust um, the number that they recommend and you guys agree on. Because at the end of the day, you make the decision. Um, realtor commissions, what is currently expected, negotiable. Uh, I think I covered that, Walter. Um, advice got, to We have 30, 30 seconds left here, Gabe. Selling our home to our children. <laughs> Um, if they can do it, do it. If you love them, give them a good, give them a, a good price. Um, I think it's a great thing. Recommend doing to your home before realtor sees your home for an estimate. Um, yeah, I would, I would just have your agent come in, take a look at your home. Don't do necessarily do anything, uh, particularly renovations, because sometimes you don't have to. And in a seller's market, you get away with not having to do a lot of uh, renovations to the property. So have your agent come in, let them do their job, make recommendations, talk it over, decide where to put your money for your best return on investment. Done. All right, Done. Gabe. Um, yeah, if you could just advance the slide. I want to thank everyone for joining today. Um, we've covered questions. One more slide. Um, yeah, if uh, I just want to let people know we have a um, wonderful um, online workshop coming up in January um, that speaks to the topic of ageism and, and how to respond to ageism um, in our society. So it's going to be a great uh, conversation with Ashton Applewhite, um, who's an author of This Chair Rocks, A Manifesto Against Ageism. I want to thank you all for joining us today and thank Gabe for sharing his expertise about successfully selling a home in an off-season market. Uh, this webinar has been recorded. It will be posted up to our website. So if you want to view it again or share it with others, you can uh, direct them to the Riverwoods uh, website. Thanks so much, everybody, for joining thank today. You. Yeah, thank you, everybody. I appreciate your time. And thanks, Lisa and Riverwoods for having me. Great. Have a good day. Bye-bye.